Open University. Hello. Um, book haul. Book haul video today. I had a very colourful and interesting weekend, um, slightly overshadowed by um, physical delicacy because I was um, I had one of my optic nerve headaches on Thursday. This is something I get regularly uh, because of the the blind eye, which is um, all shriveled and uh, dead. And uh, sometimes, if the air pressure goes down too low, or if I'm not eating properly, if I skip dinner, for instance, it's uh, or if I fly in a plane or go through the Alps and the air pressure there is lower, the pressure in the eye collapses a bit and uh, this triggers an optic nerve headache I get. I might get it like once a, once a month, so it's a, a bit like a woman's period. I go through sort of hell for a day or so. I just basically have to lie down in my little monk's cell there and recover. Over a period of uh, six hours or something, it could be longer, it could be 12 hours of uh, discomfort. Um, so I had one of those and then I was a bit weak the next day and I was invited to see the uh, hidden, not the hidden cameras, the um, um, this band from Scotland, the Trash Can Sinatras, and went up to try and drop in on their sound check but wasn't really up to seeing them. So I went second-hand clothes shopping and I bought this uh, this draped um, puce garment, is it puce, kind of brick red, uh, from a shop called um, Mam near Jusso Station. And it's part of my mania, my retro mania, basically, because it's uh, not just clothes from the past. It's not particularly old. It doesn't smell bad. Um, but also uh, um, women's clothes. So um, the next day, Saturday, I bought uh, these books in the old lady bookstore in Namba, which I go to. And... Um, she sees me coming now. She knows, she knows that I'm her best customer for the foreign section that she has there. Simply one shelf of foreign books. And so she scurries into her back room and brings out the boxes of new acquisitions. She's actually got a daughter who works in uh, um, Tokyo, who has a similar bookshop in Tokyo and gets a lot of foreign books there. It's just very close to the one of the universities, I think Keio University in Tokyo. And... Um, so her daughter sends these books regularly, foreign books down, and then if I come into the shop and she hasn't yet uh, marked them up for prices and put them on the shelf, she brings them out for me to look through the box to get the first dibs on, on them. So a lot of these are first dibs, especially the penguin ones. So I'll show you what I got. Um, I got, first of all, the, these Lawrence Durrell, the, the Alexandria Quartet, Lawrence Durrell books which everybody had on their shelves in the 1960s. If you went to any sort of respectable bourgeois house, you would see these. Um, and it's four books. Um, Darrell was um, interested in relativity, applying Einsteinian relativity to narrative. And so these are four books basically describing the same situations happening to these four characters, Claire, Mount Olive, Justine and Balthasar. It's in this order. It starts uh, with Justine. It goes on to Balthasar, then I think it's Mount Olive and then Clea. And these are sort of vaguely modelled on characters that Durrell met, dated, had children with in Alexandria. He, of course, he's a very interesting character. I met him, actually. I met him in 1985. My mother and I were walking down a, the main street in Avignon. And um, I recognised Lawrence Durrell because I'd been a big fan of his brother Gerald Durrell when I was a kid I used to read all those My Family and Other Animals Birds, be birds Beasts and Relatives and all that stuff but also because uh, Lawrence Durrell had been on TV fairly recently there was a, a really good 1976 documentary called Spirit of Place which you can find on YouTube and I very much recommend go and watch that in which he talks about he, he revisits Corfu because the Durrells were born the brothers were born in India. They were sort of colonial British administering India. And then they um, came to uh, uh, came back to Britain and um, there's a memorable scene at the beginning of My Family and Other Animals where Gerald describes Larry. Larry is this sardonic and pompous and super bohemian character in, in Gerald's books who's kind of unbearable and, and a bit of a prig and a prick. 
But um, Larry is described as saying, they've all got a cold and they're all sneezing on each other. And Larry just says, let's leave this fucking awful country. It doesn't swear because it's a children's book. Let's leave this awful country where people are just sneezing down each other's necks in circles and go somewhere nice and sunny. So they decide to go to Greece and um, they live there in the 1930s until... And, and, and then Gerald is doing his sort of menagerie experiments. He later becomes a zoologist and zookeeper. Um, Larry become, Larry almost wins the Nobel Prize for literature, although he's considered a little bit dark and, you know, sexually obsessed. There's some kind of darkness which makes the Nobel Committee uh, pass him over in, I think, 1962 or something. Um, but he, he's like the best friend of... Um, uh, Henry Miller and people like that, and uh, you know, interesting guy. So when, when I met him with my mother, uh, we, we, my mother, being rather bold, we just went up to him and said, uh, oh, Mr. Durrell, uh, how nice to see you here. We're tourists um, in France, but we used to live in Greece, as you did, and of course we read your books about Greece and stuff. So Prospero's Cell and things like this, which are set in Corfu. Um, so would you like a pastis? So we took him to a bar. He was very friendly and possibly a bit lonely. I later found out that his daughter, Sappho, had died that same year, so perhaps he was in mourning over that. Um, and I remember him saying he'd been given some med medallion or something by the French government, and he'd been asked to come up to Paris to receive that, and he was sort of grumbling about what a hassle it was to have to receive these honours and medals, but in a slightly humble, braggy, boasty way. Um, and then my mother really embarrassed me by saying, Oh, but Mr. Darrell Nicholas here is a writer too, <laughs> which I very much wasn't at the time. I hadn't written anything. I, I was scribbling short stories or typing little short stories, but I was kind of a writer type, you know. So, And he asked a question or two about uh, my writing. But luckily I was able to ask him <clears throat> an intelligent question about Provence. He was working on a non-fiction book about Provence at the time where he lived. And so I said, oh, but your book, Monsieur, has uh, has also been set in Provence and you wrote a bit about Provence in there because I'd just been given, my dad had given me for Christmas a copy of Monsieur which is subtitled The Prince of Darkness and very, very occulty kind of novel set in Provence and, and he said oh that was fiction that's different you know so <clears throat> um, but at least I could make it look like I'd read one of his books I think I'd started Monsieur but hadn't really got very far with it so yeah one of the one of the authors from that sort of great generation that I've actually met and um who also, you know, shares some experience of my family in the sense that uh, we lived in Greece. He was then chased out when the Nazis um, took over in Greece. I think first the Italians and then the Germans took over Corfu. And uh, um, so he moved to Alexandria to escape that. And that's uh, a city, basically, if you just follow the line of Greece into the Mediterranean Sea and then just hop across the water... That's Alexandria, the very north coast of Egypt. And um, so I've been immersed over the weekend in street viewing and uh, watching YouTube videos of Alexandria, watching documentaries about not just uh, uh, Lawrence Durrell, but uh, C.P. Kavafi's life in Alexandria. The idea of it being a kind of compliment to Tangier, which I was also immersed in when I was reading the Burroughs biography. The Beats all went to Tangier. Uh, people like... Uh, Darul and Kavafi went to Alexandria. And I'm always fascinated by those literary cities, especially kind of historical documents of them, film crews going there in the 70s or whatever. I was also watching some, some really good Henry Miller stuff. There's a great documentary called Miller's Odyssey, made in 1969. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Spirit of Place, made in 76, I think. So um, I started Balthazar, first of all, and then I realized that Justine was the first in the quartet and uh, went to start that. And uh, I've read like three, four pages of this. It's slight, it is a slightly pompous, highfalutin tone he has, but he comes up with a lot of interesting insights. I think Alec Finley left a, th a thing on Facebook for me saying, oh, these are terribly boring. And it's true that he's a very neglected writer. Um, now he's really not held in such high regard at all. He was not even... A British citizen in most of his life, you know, he he was born in India, and he so he had this overseas dependency status as a British citizen. He worked for lots of British embassies and things. In fact, the only book of his I have read through is Bitter Olives, which is a very short and, and funny volume about the diplomatic service in various countries. He worked in Greece a lot for the embassy, uh, press attaché for the British 
embassy, this kind of job, Athens, uh, also in Egypt and Africa and other places. So, um, Bitter Lemons is, is, is definitely worth a read. And, um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, he's sort of fallen out of favour. And uh, I guess part of the, my reason for getting these, which were like 150, 200 yen each, so, you know, like £1.50 each, pretty cheap, it was just the, for their physical, the physical reminder of people's bookshelves in the 1960s, because everybody had these. And, um, you know, I, I like, it's not that I live in the past, it's just that there's something, as somebody else commented on Facebook, um, something satisfyingly bookish about old books that you really get into as a refutation of the digital, the, the preponderance of the digital in our lives. So, uh, Lawrence Arnold, I may persist with those, I may not, I may just have them in this talismanic way as objects on my shelf. I also got, um, <clears throat> I didn't get both these, I just got one of these Evelyn Wars, but I, I put both to show you, because last time I was there I got this handful of dust. And this is Decline and Fall, which I actually did have at boarding school when I was 12. I had a little locker, the pathetic but kind of interesting thing in, in boarding school is you're in a sort of communistic society, a total institution, as Talcott Parsons would have called it, where you um, have one tiny locker for your personal property, some of which is forbidden, which is not allowed. Um, um, so some things were confiscated from me, my tape recorder. They didn't even know, the boarding school authorities didn't know what a tape, cassette tape recorder was because they'd just been invented. So they said, that's a transistor radio, and they, they weren't allowed. There was no rule about whether you could have tape recorders. So, but they classified it as a radio. It didn't even have a radio in it uh, and took it away. They took away my copy of the Hair songbook, the rock opera Hair, the lyrics and chords of Hair, because that was considered subversive and obscene. They took away... I had this American military cap I used to wear in bed, and they snatched that away from me. They took any, any interesting property which looked vaguely subcultural and subversive, they confiscated. Um, but they let me keep my Evelyn War books. Evelyn War was a big influence, not these books. I mean, first of all, I really like these because of the Bentley Farrell Burnett cover designs, which look like Beatles albums. They may, may actually have done one of those Beatles albums, like the compilation... Um, your Mother Should Know, I think it was called, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, sort of 70s take on the 1920s, which I like a lot. But also, of course, Evelyn Waugh was, um, he was a clever but conservative author. Um, I, I like his early works, and um, he's really great on preserving the 1920s that sense of the, the flapper parties, the decadence, in a sense that the 1920s were a, a, a first run. For, for rich and posh people, they were a first run-through of some of the stuff that happened in the 1960s. And I think that's probably what David Bowie was interested in when he was very much influenced by Vile Bodies for Aladdin Sane. He, he, um, I found this little passage, a guy called um, Howard Bloom, who published this in a music magazine called Circus in 1973, he said he was with Bowie in 1972. David Bowie sat in an overstuffed armchair in his suite aboard the ship Elinis, returning to London from his first triumphal tour of the States. His delicate brows knit in a look of perplexed recognition as he read Evelyn Waugh's Vile Bodies, a 40-year-old futuristic novel about a society of bright young things whirling through lavish parties in outlandish costumes, dancing, gossiping and sipping champagne. Suddenly David lowered the book to his lap, picked up the spiral notebook and pen sitting on the small mahogany table at his side and began to write the words to the title song of his new LP, Aladdin Sane. So um, that sense of decadence, and of course, you know, you can hear it in the song Aladdin Sane, passionate bright young things lead him away to war, saddling gl glissando strings. Uh, 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 uh. Um, so Evelyn Waugh, I've got quite a lot of Evelyn Waugh here in, um, in paperback. But I, but I do like those um, brunette ones. Um, and as I say, I did read this, this one, potentially just as decadent and uh, um, degrading and um, destructive to the morality of the boarding school as the cassette tape recorder would have been, or the hair lyrics book. But, um, yeah, the idea of simply divine decadence, darling... Uh, what else did I get? I got um, E.M. Forces, A Room with a View, which was big, of course, in the 80s, but this is really just um, 
Ian Forster also lived in Alexandria at, some, at one point, interestingly enough. Uh, he's another of these characters, this sort of weird nexus. Um, yeah, um, yeah, two books about Alexandria he, he published as a result of his sojourn there in the First World War when he was with the Red Cross. Uh, but this, of course, is his book about Florence, which has um, became... I mean, there's lots of horrible editions with pictures, stills from the film. That's always the, the beginning of the end of a book is when you get the edition with the still from the film in the front. But this is a slightly nicer one. Um, and I like this. This is the Penguin Modern Classics design from just before I would have been buying Penguin Modern Classics. It's a late 1960s design. It still has the old pre-decimal currency. By the way, have UKIP um, promised to return to pre-decimal currency yet? I'm surprised if they haven't. But, uh, yeah, decimalization um, is treachery in some people's eyes already. It's the beginning. I read an article in one of these awful tabloids saying it was the beginning of the, uh, the decline of Britain uh, when we decimalized the currency. So, yeah, I just bought that because I like the, uh, that grey and white uh, cream kind of period of... Uh, Penguin Modern Classics. The Rape of the Lock by Alexander Pope um, in a kind of didactic educational edition, 100 yen, this was very cheap. I've been described as the Alexander Pope of um, pop. The Pope of pop, that's me. So The Rape of the Lock, which I did study at university, is kind of satire on the spoilt aristocratic ladies um, uh, in a way that you could never do now because you, know, you don't joke about rape, it's terrible. Um, talking of satire, let's go to um, Erewhon, Samuel Butler, I got this Erewhon, which of course is nowhere backwards and is a kind of satire on utopian novels. It comes out at the end of the 19th century and is quite related to News from Nowhere by um, William Morris. And um, Samuel Butler um, wanted, first of all, to be a, an art, a painter. And he actually studied art, an Irishman, essentially, um, I think. No, wait, no, sorry, he was born in Nottinghamshire. Um, he, he went to New Zealand and became like a shepherd <laughs> in New Zealand. And then went to art school in Edinburgh and tried to become a painter and failed. But then this Erewhon actually reflects the New Zealand part, because he sort of bases this imaginary utopia on New Zealand. And there's a bit in here, there's a whole section... Uh, called the um, the machines, um, the book of the machines, which um, in which he he describes how in his utopia machines are completely banned because they uh, threaten to take over. Um, the people in this utopia know that uh, machines will develop sentience; they will become intelligent uh, creatures on their own and take over the world, and and so. Um, this actually influenced um, Gilles Deleuze, the French philosopher, who then he wrote Anti-Oedipus with uh, Guattari, Felix Guattari, and they have a whole section where they're talking about um, vitalism uh, and how, how Samuel Butler's prediction of these intelligent machines and their danger, which is very real to us today, we really see this, that we just read an article about how the, the whole, the current Trump administration is based on a this uh, billionaire who's uh, into algorithms and uh, influencing people politically by finding out market research information from these social media networks and things. Um, that's the beginning of a kind of very sinister coup based on machine intelligence. But um, yeah, um, in the Anti-Oedipus, um, Butler is held up as an exemplar of someone who's not opposing vitalism to mechanic mechanism mechanicism. Um, but actually saying that uh, there is a kind of ma machine-like quality to humans and there's a human-like quality to machines. So it's a much more subtle, it's not just this dichotomy. So this looks like it'll be worth a read. And also a lot of my books have been about countries and fiction about countries in sort of imaginary um, dystopian or utopian fiction about, you know, the Book of Scotland, the Book of Japan, even on America, which is really essentially the Book of Americas. Um, all take as their main lead character, a country. I'm sort of really, uh, if I'm consuming books, I'm sort of more interested in reading about cities and hence looking at Alexandria over the weekend and thinking, wow, what's, what's that like as a literary city? There's a really good um, colloquium, <coughs> dramatized conference in Brooklyn, I think, 
about C.P. Kavafi, which I would recommend also you find on YouTube, which, uh, <clears throat> in which there's a long speech about how there is um, really no Alexandria. And the Al Alexandria that each of these writers knew is kind of imaginary. The Alexandria of the Alexandria Quartet is really a, a state of the spirit and imagination of Lawrence Durrell. Same thing with Kavafi's Alexandria. You can't go there now and expect to find these places. They are literary constructs. The, the villa um, where um, Lawrence Durrell lived has just been demolished. With, well, it was demolished in 2011 um, because, because there's rent control in Alexandria and the owner of the building couldn't increase the rents sufficiently to justify his investment in the site and has now built a tower block in its place. So this is what happens in cities. But um, something obviously does survive. The trams run through the city. There's still a certain... Uh, feeling there. Hilaire Belloc, Selected Essays. I mean, I know him as the author of the Cautionary Tales for Children, the poems for children, which are, I could recite by heart. But uh, these are his um, essays, which are probably humorous, um, interesting, in, on London and the houses in it, uh, The Servants of the Rich, The Honest Man and the Devil, The Letter, uh, yeah, little amusing satirical things, and of course another classic Penguin from the uh, from the nineteen um, fifties, two and sixpence. I think this is a fifties one. These are great. When I just, you know, I think that you know, price of a cup of coffee, I could have this. The Thurber album. This is kind of similar, but an American humorist called Thurber, who I thought was just an uh, an illustrator, cartoonist, but actually these are essays by Thurber. Daguerreotype of a lady, the tree and the diamond conversation piece. Um, so amusing stuff that he probably wrote for periodicals in the, gosh, I don't know when, 1920s or something. This was first published in 1952, but I, I guess it's uh, published in magazines before that, long before that. <coughs> um, John Webster, three plays. I studied this at university. Uh, the White Devil especially left a mark on me as sort of very violent and um, he's a contemporary of Shakespeare. Um, and they're kind of, uh, there's lots of action and lots of morality pointed up very strongly. Um, gruesome and quite interesting stuff, which I probably will never get around to reading. Aldous Huxley, Mortal, Mortal Coils, Five Stories. Um, short stories by Aldous Huxley. I've been collecting his books over the last year or so, especially these old editions. I don't like, you know, the Aldous Huxley, of, the late Aldous Huxley of Doors of Perception. When he moved to L.A., I also don't like, I mean, Henry Miller, when Henry Miller moved to L.A., they, he really lost it as well. Uh, um, Aldous Huxley tried to become a sort of guru, the kind of guru he was satirizing, the kind of quack spiritualist he was satirizing in some of his early novels. He actually sort of started to become, with his drugs, period, you know, his uh, uh, becoming a countercultural figure in the 1960s. And so you'll get, I mean, The Doors, the, the band The Doors is named after his book, The Doors of Perception. That kind of thing that druggies, always, musicians always have on their shelves, if they have any Aldous Huxley at all, they just have the late stuff about acid, you know, when he teamed up with Timothy Leary. But um, I like his early stuff when he was just a clever young man, a little bit like um, Evelyn Waugh, but not, not so Tory as Evelyn Waugh. And you can see in, in, the, in the things, he's, he's always got these characters who are quack spiritualists or something, and you can see he's sort of experimenting with mocking these characters before actually becoming one of them. Um, the Horse's Mouth by Joyce Carey. Uh, Joyce Carey, yeah, he was the one who was born in Ireland. Uh, and uh, Oh, he's the one who studied art in Edinburgh and Paris. Maybe I got him mixed up. Yes, sorry, I was getting, uh, yeah, getting him mixed up with the other one. Joyce Carey, um, most famous for this, this novel. This is the most famous novel. It was made into a film the year after he died. He died in '57. It was made by Alec Guinness, actually, who even wrote the bought, I think, the rights to the novel, wrote the script himself, and then starred as this character, Gully, who's released from prison, who's a sort of bohemian artist. So very much drawing on Joyce Carey's um, experiences uh, trying to be a painter in Edinburgh College of Art. Um, uh, but he's, um, Gully is a kind of outrageous, scandalous bohemian who doesn't, who doesn't pay any attention to bourgeois morals and um, is <clears throat> sort of amusing and troublemaking for that reason. Uh, actually, I did get another one, which is a duplicate copy, not a duplicate copy, another copy of... Uh, uh, 
a, a book I already had, which was Chrome Yellow, the Penguin Modern Classics of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. That was another one I got the other day. So, I mean, I paid 2,000 yen, I think, in total for these dozen or so books, which is about 20 US dollars. And um, I've been asking myself, why? what is this retromania? What is it all about? The fact that I'm... Uh, so disinvested in the present, because basically if I open newspapers or whatever in the present, it's all about this awful Donald Trump fellow or a Nigel Farage fellow. Or These are absolutely the worst scum in the world. It's funny, Jerry Brown, the um, California politician, came to visit uh, Henry Miller in uh, Los Angeles. And, uh, and Henry Miller, who was very forthright, said... I consider you politician fellows the, the worst of the worst, the lowest of the lowest, the scum of the scum. Um, Jerry Brown seemed to lap that up and probably agreed with it. Um, in the, the interim, of course, they've got even worse. They've got even more scummy. I mean, Jerry Brown, an absolute saint compared with anybody in the current administration. But, uh, yeah, I suppose I, I'm an expat in more ways than one. And I think the... I'm sort of spiritually expatriated, uh, or an immigrant, if you prefer that word. I mean, this word expat is uh, is perhaps overused and uh, discriminatory, because if you're the wrong color, you're an immigrant, and if you're white, you're an expat. But um, basically, it's about being an internal exile, uh, and therefore about um, stuff that I've been talking about in these, these little talks, like um, uh, abjuring or renouncing or standing back from things that you don't like. Filtering, I also talk about a lot. All these things, I mean, obviously the old lady bookshop is a way to filter out everything in my own culture except things from very literary and high-minded things from 40, 50 years ago, from the 20th century. And uh, the same with clothes. I can filter out macho. I mean, I'm, I'm a great enemy of masculinity, a certain image of masculinity. So when I buy women's clothes, these are women's trousers, this is a woman's and also an Asian, very distinctively Asian garment um, I've got this funny little mitten for the um, for the sound for the iPhone uh, which is recording sound which is slung around my neck and I've got a clothes peg holding everything together but um, it's obviously a desire to be expatriated from my own gender if you think about it that way uh, to not have to account for the crimes of masculinity which are legion I can assure you um, and, and of course I am I am a pretty masculine guy I have a penis um, believe it or not I am uh, um, rather led by my by what what dangles between my legs in the famous words of uh, Ian Gittins the rock writer why is Momus this tender bedsit poet led by what dangles between his legs this was the review he wrote for um, I think Poison Boyfriend or maybe it was Tender Pervert as if he believed in me, if, if there could be a me that was sort of independent from sex. And this is also what the, the Nobel Commission said when they uh, decided to pass over uh, Lawrence Darrell. Why is he so obsessed with sex? You know, this monomaniacal, I think, was the adjective they used. Monomaniacal interest in sex. And, of course, it's, it sort of implies that you could disentangle the genius of a, an author from his carnal desire and his embodiment as a man. I don't, I don't want to deny any of that, but I do want to um, escape from a certain kind of <clears throat> stereotypical notion of masculinity, i.e. being macho and tough in a certain kind of way, wearing black leather jackets or whatever. I don't want to be that at all. I'd rather embrace uh, um, colours and uh, expressiveness and uh, that kind of stuff, you know. So um, I, I probably um, my camera only does 29 minutes that's why these open university things are less always less than 29 minutes so i've probably done something like that now i wanted to talk a little bit more about maybe this idea of being a an expat not just in space but in time and retromania and all that that stuff but um there probably isn't time there's lots of other opportunities broadcasts so open university